Hey, good morning. Just as a preview text, if you'd like more information regarding our gathering on Sunday mornings, feel free to text or call Aaron, 218-591-6471. My name's Pete. We're studying the book of Ephesians. And so if you could open your Bibles, please, to Ephesians. We will read verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's have a brief word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Ephesians. Thank you that grace and peace comes from you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that as believers, we have the third person of the Trinity indwelling in us. Amazing, Lord that how this Trinity works together to bring you the honor and glory and trust that that would be our desire this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week we covered uh, an introduction to Ephesians in verse 1, and we'd like to finish up with verse 2, and then we'll move on into the next paragraph, verses 3 through 6. So, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ubiquity dilutes gravitas. And so here's what one commentator says about that phrase, ubiquity dilutes gravitas. Unfortunately, as in most things, ubiquity dilutes gravitas. Because it is so familiar, ubiquity, or common, ubiquity, to us, we often pass over it. We dilute it, like we would dilute us with a solution, and we dilute the gravity or the weight of that saying or that truth. By so, by so doing, however, we take a massive theological sentiment and make it a throwaway line. I trust that wouldn't be what we're doing here this morning. We would want to be able to say, you know what, <clears throat> here's a massive theological sentiment, a truth, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul's introduction to all of his 13 epistles. So here's what one commentator says regarding this introduction that Paul has in each of his epistles. May you know, this would be Paul's prayer for the believer at the beginning of his epistles and his desire for you and me. May you know the generous power of God's grace undergirding and coming to expression in your daily life. This is a prayer for the unbounded and wholly generous outreaching power of God's grace, which makes for the believer's best well-being. And the understanding of the believer's best well-being is as a result of grace, you have peace or God has your best in mind. And this is the understanding of well-being. We saw last time that the <clears throat> root word, for epistle or apostle, or the root part of that etymology, the word S-T-L-E, is evidence for existence is provided. So when we are thinking in terms of why would we want to read the epistles, we want the evidence for what existence. We want the bell say, I want to know all about the grace that can come from God and his peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's read Acts chapter 20. If we would turn your Bibles there, please. Acts chapter 20. This is Paul exhorting the Ephesian elders. But we'll just read the one verse in verse 32 as he's concluding his exhortation to the Ephesian elders. And he says in verse 32, So now, brethren... Acts 20, 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. Let's read that again. This is, this is amazing. He's saying, I'm going to leave you and I'm, gonna I'm exhorting you elders, you pastors. I commend you to God. I'm actually asking that this is an exhortation for you to think about your God, and to the word of his grace. How are we going to get the word of his grace to us? Well, I would suggest for sure in the 13 epistles of Paul, the existence of the tremendous grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
So when we think of specifically what is it that's going to build us up in this amazing grace that we have from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, look at Colossians chapter 3, if you would, please. Colossians chapter 3. And let's look at verse 16, Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ, and we could say that would be synonymous with the word of what, according to Acts 20, 32? The word of his grace would be, where are we going to find all this grace and truth? Through who? Through God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with what in your hearts to the Lord? Grace. How can we get built up? We continue on before God, getting built up in the things of Christ centered around him and his grace. Grace to you from God the Father. Hey, Christine. Everybody knows you just came in late. <laughs> totally kidding. Totally kidding. Sorry. Good to see you. Yeah. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Ubiquity dilutes gravitas. So here's a singer. Actually, this gal sings at John Clark's church, and she was singing a song a couple weeks ago. She said, Oh, the beauty of the Lord our God, oh, awesome, the what of his grace? The gravity of his grace. We could say the weight of his grace. This grace that he's shown towards us, should this be weighty in our minds? Should this be a very a truth that has full of gravity to it? And so when we think of something that has weight to it, we think in terms of a, maybe a scale or a double pan balance, and we could say, wow, this guy's carrying a lot of weight here. In fact, this is Zeus. He was condemned, or Zeus, con this is Atlas. Zeus condemned Atlas to hold the world on his back. So where, what, would we, what phrase would we use today when you're burdened? You seem to be carrying, somebody's got to help me out this time. What's that? The weight of the world, thank you. So you seem to be carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, right? And so everything's coming down on you. You're depressed, you're full of anxiety, you're having all kinds of difficulties and trials in life, and you're thinking, what, is there any what? Is there any hope? Is there any release? Is there anything that could bring me peace, very good, in this situation, to take away my anxiety? And is there? One of my uh, cherished thoughts about the Lord Jesus Christ is when he says this in John 16, 33, he says this. These things have I have spoken to you that in me you may have what? Peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've overcome. Hey, Carly, how you doing? Good. Thanks for that response. Yeah, I'm doing good. So let me give that again. John 16, 33. These things that I have spoken to you from the Lord Jesus Christ, that in me you may have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And here's what one author has to say about this, the Lord Jesus Christ giving this encouragement to his disciples. When they would be hated, pursued, persecuted, falsely accused, falsely condemned, and even torture, they could have what? Peace in him. Now this would not happen. When does he overcome the world? While he's walking on earth? When does he overcome the world? When he wrote, when he died for the sins of the world, when they, when individual places their faith in him, they can say, you know what? I am an overcomer because I am in Christ. And therefore you can have this peace. So where is this peace found? In him. That in me you may have peace in me. So what is it? How can we have this weight of the world lighter in our minds? Because we have a heavier weight, right? We have the weight of knowing 
that we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, are you in the Lord Jesus Christ by your works or by grace? Are you totally accepted in the beloved by works or by grace? Do you have to work out your situation and your anxiety or can you just say, you know what? I, I'm in the one that's overcome this entire world system. So now the way to the world is a lot lighter, isn't it? Because your answer for your great peace in life is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you read Hebrews chapter 11, you read all the Old Testament saints, and one of the verses is the world was not worthy. Basically it's saying in the vernacular, I don't care what the others say about me. I don't care what the world has to say. I've got something better. I've got Christ the overcomer. This is where I can have tremendous grace through understanding his person and his work and my acceptance in him. And therefore, I'm at peace no matter what situation I'm in. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Believers have a dual existence. They're in Christ and in this world, but they're in union with Jesus. This is his comment, this, uh, this author's comment on John 16, 33. His disciples have peace, but the world exerts a hostile pressure. The world's system, the enemy of God and his people opposed Jesus' message and ministry, but Jesus won the victory over the system. He has overcome this world as the strong man who came and ruined Satan. That's, that's our picture of Satan as an angel who can cruise around on, or back and forth over planet Earth and be the God of this world. But Jesus Christ is the victor. He is our hyper Nikael, our super victor, our super overcomer in our lives. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what one author has to say about peace. Peace means a spirit at rest in all the changing circumstances of life. Amen. You had any changing circumstances lately? Or maybe you got an even keel? But where are we going to find our peace? In the Lord Jesus Christ. The saints already have experienced peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by... Faith, we have peace with God. That's already secured that you're positionally in Christ. The issue is, are you going to walk by faith and find your comfort as you are willing to abide in these things of Christ so that you can have practical peace in your daily life, no matter what the, what are, the circumstances are. So, this is the peace of God here, but day by day, they needed the peace of God. And I like what this author, that is the calm, settled repose that is independent of what's going on in your life. Do you see the paradox here? You got things going on in your life? Everybody's got things going on in their life, right? Maybe, maybe good, maybe bad, maybe even keel. But the fact of the matter is, you know what? No matter what, I can have a calm, settled repose that is independent of my circumstances. So all these changing circumstances, you have the Spirit of God within you, the third person of the Trinity, which is pretty amazing, isn't it? The God of the universe that indwells you to want to make the grace and peace of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ become your reality. And then at the end it says, regarding this calm, settled response that is independent of circumstance and that results from taking everything to God in prayer. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the classic verses on having peace with God, or the peace of God, excuse me, is Philippians chapter four, if you could turn there, please. Philippians chapter four. Verse six, <clears throat> be anxious for nothing. And in contrast to that, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So there's another verse that's very, very similar that most of you are very familiar with that's along exactly the same lines. Here we're being anxious for nothing, but we're going to him in prayer because we know that he is the affectionate, loving, benevolent God full of grace, right? We can go to him for this peace, can't we? We can say, I've got requests, Lord. I'm in a situation and I want understanding. I want spiritual insight from you. I need your peace here. But a verse that's very similar to that is 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. What's another word for casting all your care upon him? Cast all your anxiety, amen, right? So do you see the commonality with Philippians 4 here? Casting all your anxiety upon him, why? How do you know he cares for you? How about all the wonderful grace and mercy he showed towards you at the cross? How about the, that you're accepted in him? How about no matter what happens in the future, you're going to go home to be with him? Wow, is that caring for you? Casting all of this anxiety upon him, for he cares for you. Here's what one author has to say. There is anxious care in the words, casting all your care upon him. And there is affectionate care in the words, he careth for you. Over against all our own anxious care is our Savior's never failing affectionate care. Where are you going to find all this affectionate care? You know, on uh, Webster's, if you look up the, the word affection, you're going to find synonyms somewhere on the line for the word mercy and grace. And where do you find all this mercy and grace? What does Hebrews 4.16 say? Let's look there. Hebrews 4.16 is very similar to 1 Peter 5.7 and Philippians 4.6 and 7. Very much relational, those, all, those are all related to each the other. Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let's start in verse 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest, boy, you got it. this is great in the book of Hebrews. Where is our high priest sitting right now? In the heavenlies, at the right hand of where? The Father. Does, does he have an affectionate, loving care for you sitting there? Does he have your best in mind? Does he have goodwill towards you? So then it says, seeing that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us hold fast to this understanding, this confession that we have. Let's hold that. Let's hold on to that. Let's not waver and be double-minded. Let's keep on keeping on. Let's hold fast by faith to this affectionate, high priest that we have. For, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses because he came to earth and he was a fully a man, wasn't he? He's been through it all. But was in, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet he didn't sin. So he knows all the struggles. We have a victorious high priest and we can say, I can go to him. I can cast all my care, I can be anxious for nothing, but I'm gonna keep going to him with supplications, requests, and have this affectionate care overwhelm me or have this peace in my life. So therefore, because of our savior and his affectionate care for us, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why can we go there? Because our sins have already been judged, haven't they? Do we have freedom in Christ before him? Yeah, are we accepted in the beloved? Amen. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Actually, one author says in time of need is just in the nick of time. Thanks, Lord. Wow. I've been going to you and ah, I've got this peace beyond all circumstances. And then let's read Philippians 4.8. I should have had you mark, have your finger there. Philippians 4, 8. So once you're enjoying this peace of Christ, what's, what can you do now? You, you, you hole up somewhere and just cower around, you know, you're saying, I got this piece of Christ. What, what do we do now? What's our response in terms of our next step? It's very clear in Philippians, it says in verse eight then, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, 
what sort of things are pure, what sort of things are lovely, what sort of things are good report. If there's any virtue or equality in these things, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the things which you've learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So here's the cool thing. You've got this wonderful freedom in Christ in our first few verses about being anxious for nothing. He'll guard our hearts through Christ Jesus. I don't know if I, did I mention that at the beginning in the piece of, yeah, verse seven, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understand, will guard your heart and minds through who? Christ Jesus, because he's your, he's accepted in the beloved. You've got all these wonderful things to meditate on Christ. You're free in Christ Jesus. So if you're free in Christ Jesus, are you free now to say my next step is in my character can be true and noble? Can it be just and pure? Can it be a lovely and good report, those types of characters? Can it be while you're enjoying this freedom in Christ, free from the pressures of this world, can you still be a testimony for Christ by thinking of those things, meditating on those things? Amen. This is, when, this is what you're doing. You're just walking in a right way of thinking while you're enjoying your heart being guarded in Christ Jesus. Do you think you could go through and travel through and navigate through life with that mindset and, st and be a testimony for Christ? You don't have to look very closely to find the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 8. Some individuals believe verse 8 is a mini, bio, uh, mini biography of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. So you want to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ and his character? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? I mean, wow, you're going to see compassion there. You're going to see somebody who's true and noble and just and pure and lovely and of good report. So I didn't know if I was going to bring this out, so it's totally your liberty. I know some believers don't like watching shows that have Christ characterized and it kind of ruins their understanding of Christ, but I decided to. So it's between you and the Lord. I have a good friend who's a pastor who won't watch these kind of shows, but you know, if you've ever watched The Chosen, and if you want to get an idea of Christ being true and noble and just and pure and lovely and good report, that certainly could be helpful to you, but i not... Whatever, you got my point, okay? So let's look at one more verse on peace in 2 Thessalonians 3.16. 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Thessalonians are like a lot of believers when these epistles are written they're going through a lot of a lot of persecution aren't they what would you want to know when you're getting persecuted or unjustly you know whatever are you with me so what would you want to know? what would you want other people to pray for you how about this prayer right here look at second thessalonians three sixteen. now may the lord of peace who is the king of peace who is the lord of who is the lord of peace where are we going to find this peace outside of this world through christ now may the Lord of peace himself, you know why it says it again himself? It says it for what? For more emphasis. The Lord himself. Give you peace always in how many ways? Every way. The Lord be with you all. That's what we can pray for other believers. We can pray grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, we're going to move on to our next paragraph. Let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. Now we're getting into the letter. Verse 1 and 2 is the greeting. Verse 3 is now our understanding, beginning our understanding of the, the book of Ephesians. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. 
So that diagram means there's a bunch of words that are could have a flow of thought. So we're going to get a look at all these similar words that we just read. One group of words was blessed, blessings, chose, holy, without blame, love, predestined, adoption, sons, and accepted. And then just briefly in the second set, the word blessed is different than the idea of ver the uh, column one about being blessed. So we'll get into that. So in column two, it's blessed or praised. So we'll just come up with a simple thought regarding our text in Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Anybody want to try for a simple thought? I never, it's so, my, my titles are clunky, I understand, but they're designed to be using words only that are in the text. I always think that if I could go back and read the text and remember even more of a clunky uh, title than one that's just, Whatever. So see what I mean? It's already clunky, isn't it? So what's the simple thought if you're going to take word, a word or a word from column one or column two or both? Excuse me. Yeah. See, this is where the part where I get these little. What's that? Blessed is in there a lot. Okay. So. Um, I kind of, well, we'll just start this praise for blessing. Right on. Praise for blessings. So I switched the order up. I should have put column two first because I usually try to have it in order. So that's why you guys weren't even correct. Sorry. <laughs> so what's a simple thought? It's just really praising God for blessings. And then we have our paragraph to make the flow of thought with all the other words that sent, go around this thought. Now, in this particular section, it's praise the Father for spiritual blessings. So we're not talking about physical blessings here. It's very clear that as we looked at last week, we're in the church age. We're not an earthly people. We are a heavenly people. We're not a physical people in terms of where we're looking for blessings. We are a spiritual people in this age, this church age of grace. By the way, the next section in the passage will be the blessings from God the Son. And then the last section in this lengthier section in Ephesians 1 will be how we understand blessings through the Holy Spirit. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So here's our text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Greek word there is eulogeo. And by the way, I probably won't make an attempt to pronounce Greek words very often, so I'll just say there is the Greek word, okay? So there's the Greek word, and you means well, and that means word, and obviously this is where we get our English word eulogy. It means to speak well of, to praise, to celebrate with praises of that which is addressed to God, acknowledging his goodness, with a desire for his glory. That would be our desire, to have who as our object of special attention. To give him the glory of saying, you know what, Lord, I have this desire to praise you. I have this desire to speak well of you, to give you a eulogy. I have this mindset that wants to do that. I want you to be my object of special attention. So when somebody, when something's an object of special attention to you, it moves you in that direction, doesn't it? And you say, that's really engaging. That really gets me moving in my mind, doesn't it? When something's like worthwhile to look at or to think about. Or you could say, that's really gripping or that's really attractive to me. So when we think of people getting glory or scenarios where a group of people got glory, you would say, that was really gripping or that was an attractive thing for me to think about. So maybe you're familiar with the movie Glory, the, the group of African-Americans who fought in the Civil War. And if you watch the movie, it probably brought you to a mindset that said, you know, I, that really brought my attention up to this group of individuals where they got the glory, right? That was a gripping, and you might even say that was what kind of a movie. Hey, that was a good movie, right? Or Glory Road. First all-black team to play 
in the NCAA or in uh, college division one, if I have my right, in the 1960s from Texas. All uh, starting five were African Americans, which was unusual at that time. And so when you watch that movie, you're thinking, well, they have my special attention, this coach and these five guys. It was pretty gripping and engaging, wasn't it? Or like we saw last week, there's the, there's the uh, media company called Glory Hog, which is all about who? You. And they have drones and videos of your bicycling, your motorcycle races, your sailboating. And they put this whole scenario together. It's about you. And you watch the movie and you say, that's really what? Gripping. That's engaging watching me. Right? Are you with me? And I am getting the what? special attention here and I like the glory. So I don't mean to cut anybody down, but I'm in an exercise joint down in Tucson and we're in the, the, the men's locker room and this kid, young kid, he's got a towel around him and I'm walking through right by him and he's got his, so if you do this, you know, we probably all done it in our bathrooms, but he's got his selfie going and he's flexing in front of the mirror and he's looking at that and I'm walking right by him. And he's like, dude, aren't you, don't you, have, I mean, aren't you like uh, embarrassed at all that you're doing this in front of everybody? I didn't tell him that obviously, but then I just thought, well, so be it. And, or maybe we'll just keep going. Go. How about maybe you're, you have this patriotic spirit in you, which by the grace of God, thank be the Lord, we live in this country. And you read the, you read a story of the old glory of the flag. And you say, that's really what? Gripping. That really gets my attention. Or a book written about 2 Corinthians 3.18 about how we get transformed from glory to glory. And this is what should really ultimately be gripping us, isn't it? That's why I like Psalm 73. It says this. Whom I have in heaven but you. And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. Lord, you are the one I want to speak well of in my life. You are the one that I want to praise. I really like what Peter said to, John, in, to, to Lord Jesus in John chapter 6. But Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. You know what I like about a scene like that? There's only how many people hanging around? 12 disciples and maybe a few others. So do we really care ultimately about trying to knock the world 8 billion people over? So if you get convinced it's not about numbers and you're convinced that there's this little group of individuals that are sitting there saying, where else are we going to go? And if we can simply say, you know what? I want to have Christ first place in my life. He's got the words of eternal life. I don't want to kowtow to this world system no matter what the numbers show. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Who is this God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Who is he? Does he have a power to bless us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places? Does he have that ability to do that? Is he ultimately the King of Kings? Is he righteous? Is he just? Is he loving? Is he eternal life? Is he powerful enough to do that? Omnipresent, omniscient, never changing. Is he full of grace and truth, veracity? Amen, this is our God. Can he bless us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Amen. Why would we wanna give him the praise? Well, it starts with the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for us on the cross, how he was, he was lifted up on a cross and he took care of all of our sins, past, present, future. There's none left for us to pay for. He paid it all. Our salvation isn't by us attaining by our good works. It's Christ's work for us. So when John said in 129, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the what? Did he take it all away? Amen. Not everybody's saved, but only those who appropriate that he took away all 
our sins are saved, who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So why would we say I want to bless him? Or why would we want to say I eulogize or bless him or praise him? Blessed who has blesseth with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you would please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 16, uh, you know, I'm guilty. Let's go back a couple more verses. Verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us. Why? Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Very powerful. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. We knew Christ when he walked humanly on earth, right? They could relate to him as, a, as the God-man on earth. But what he, when he leaves earth, how are you going to relate to him? Where is he? He rose again. He's sitting at the right hand of God. Well, then how can I relate to him? Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Here's the glory of God the Father. He sends his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for our sins. He was buried and rose again. He now sits at the right hand of the Father. He is no longer on earth. He is in the heavenlies, fully God, fully man right now. Before we were saved, we were blind to this truth. We were blinded by the God of this world, and we didn't understand the finished work of Christ. But when we took that by faith, we can say, wow, because of the Spirit of God indwelling within us, we can say, now I have eternal life. And then as you get taught more in the body of truth, in the faith, you can have an understanding that what happened to you the moment you believed in Christ, although the understanding of the growing of that comes later, hopefully sooner than later, that you actually died with Christ, you died to the world, the flesh, the devil, and that you're sitting there with Christ in the heavenly. This is what it means to be a new creation in Christ. That's why it says old things have passed away. What does it mean old things? Your whole perspective of life, perspective, what you, how you used to see it through your glasses was, it's all about the wor this world and me and how, what, do I, what do I identify with in this world system? What do I identify with? But when you get saved, now you can identify with all these new things that you never understood before you were saved. Never. It was impossible because they're super what kind of truths? They're supernatural truths. They're not natural. So you need the Spirit of God to be able to say, you know what? I got a whole new perspective on life. It's amazing. Now I can behold these things. But before you can behold these things, you need to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world to know that your sins are forgiven when you place your faith in Christ. Then you can say, wow, behold, all things are new. I have a whole new perspective on life. And our understanding in Ephesians 1 is this, I have all these new spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where I live spiritually. Then as a result of beholding this new creation in Christ and having all these spiritual blessings, we can understand where Ephesians 2.10 fits in. If you could turn your Bibles there, please. We can understand where Ephesians 2.10, and we'll get there later, but I think it's a great verse to show first and then what flows out of that. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, and I did it again. Let's go to verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves salvation's a free gift, no strings attached. Not of your works, anything you can do to gain you. If you could work your way to heaven, then you'd be boasting, right? Who's supposed to get all the glory in the cross? Why do we call him the Savior? We don't save ourselves. 
Who are we boasting in ourselves or boasting in Christ? Who do we eulogize in our Christian life? Who do we praise for what? His amazing grace. Then it says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created where? In Christ Jesus. Are we a new creation in Christ? Are all things new? Then as a result of that, we can have a purpose for good works in our life, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk what? In those good works. Those would be fruitful good works, wouldn't they? Because they're all a result of being enamored, eulogizing and getting occupied with my blessings that I have in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place in Christ. Notice it's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blessed one is also the blesser. And when we say he's blessed us, we could say that's really engaging. That, that's really gripping. That's attractive. And I want to I want to lay hold of that. This is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. If you could look there, please. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3 verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Has Christ gotten a hold of us by being new creations in Christ and given us all spiritual blessings? Is that attractive? Should we want to lay hold of that? Should we want to lay hold of that in our thinking? Is it reasonable to say, I want to get to know these things more and more and keep maturing until I go home to be with the Lord? I want to lay hold of it so I can keep, I want to keep having God elevated as my object of special attention. Praise God. That's what we do. We eulogize him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I love what this author has to say about verse 3. The blessing of enablement. Can blessings enable, when you get a gift, does it kind of move you? Depends on what gift, if you got an ugly, if you got an ugly Christmas sweater. I mean, something that's like, wow. Does it move you? Does it say, do, do, do you want to eulogize them a little bit, maybe speak well of them? The blessing of enablement, spiritual power and capacity. Though we are weak and without capacity for spiritual things, this is not natural, is it? These are not so things according to the world. Grace means special divine ability is secured. Notice if it's secured, is it by our efforts? If it's secured by his grace, then we go on like, wow, amazing gift for the believer through the grace of God, which is ours in Christ. No wonder why Paul tells Timothy as a young pastor, hey, therefore, in light of all that you could be going through, my son, my beloved son in the faith, be enabled, same word, 1 Timothy 1.12, in the what? The grace that is found in my new creation in Christ. I want to eulogize my Savior. Here's what the Amplified says in 2 Timothy 2.1. So you, my son, be strong, be strengthened inwardly. This isn't going to happen through some external behavior code, is it? This is an internal engaged mind. Be strengthened in the grace, spiritual blessing that is to be found only in one place. Where are you going to find it? In Christ Jesus. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And where is it found? Yeah, in Christ. Out of this world. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Did we get started right at 10, basically? Yeah. Okay. 
Well, it's like 10 to, so I usually like to go 50 or 60 minutes. So thank you. We will um, close in prayer and praise God. And next time we'll pick it up in Ephesians 1, 3, Lord willing, next Sunday. So I'll have a word of prayer. Thanks, Father, for your amazing grace. Simple truths here, but amazing power and enablement through the Spirit which enables us because of you, Father, giving all these blessings through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray if anybody's listening, Father, that they would initially understand to behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that their sins have been totally paid and Christ died and rose again and is sitting at the right hand. And as believers, Father, we'd say, I want to keep beholding these wonderful truths about all things are new in Christ Jesus. And we would have you, Father, as our object of special attention. In Christ's name we pray.